recording. Okay, Sarah McCormack, we are up and running. It's brilliant to have you on here today to talk about your uh, athletic career and uh, progressions, performances, etc. Um, how are things for you? You're based in Ambleside in the Lake District, yeah? Yeah, in the Lake District, yeah. So things are pretty good. It's a big day here in the UK because we've got um, sort of non-essential businesses are allowed to open again and you're allowed to sort of travel a bit more. So things are starting to look up a bit, which is really nice, yeah. Good. And, and you're working, uh, you've got a few things going on at the moment. One of them is the Mission Links uh, Coaching Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, that's myself and my partner, Paul. We've been coaching for six years now. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we're we kind of primarily um, off-road coaches. So fell, trail, ultra trail. Um, but I've got a background in track and cross country as well. So we really kind of do a bit of everything. Um, and Paul does uh, kind of also some he does a rehab side of things and the kind of strength and mobility side of things as well. And um, so, yeah, we're just coaches based in the UK. We do online kind of coaching for people and um, some in-person events when that kind of thing is allowed as well. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think today's going to be, uh, things are going to get busy a few down the road now as a result of today's opening up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely going to be busy out here in the in the mountains, I think. Brilliant, brilliant. And, uh, and and interestingly, you know, a couple of things uh, I'm thinking about now is that we've had snow over the weekend, which is uh, crazy for April. But, um, but tell me about how you organise your training, you know, in snowy weather. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, because we had quite a lot of snow in the winter and there was definitely a period in January where it's really um, affecting training because... Obviously, it was in the mountains, but um, we kept getting black ice on the roads, and I think it was um, the same in a lot of places. I know Scotland had had a lot of black ice as well, so imagine um, it was probably similar in Ireland at times, and uh, that was quite tricky, yeah, because the gyms were closed. There's no kind of option to go on the treadmill either, so I did end up doing... Um, I remember doing a few short hill rep sessions to avoid kind of going up too high in the mountains, um, but also having the grass underfoot so you couldn't fall too hard if, if you did fall. But it was very much a case of waking up on the day and assessing what was going to be more lethal, whether it was a, a road session or a, a hill session, definitely. That's interesting that you uh, talk about um, planning to fall on the ice. Um, I know when I first did uh, the sk Skido um, uh, fell race, and, and, and as you know, there's a, there's a massive... Uh, descent down Jenkins Hill and, and it, back in the day my plan was I looked at the course I thought well I'm going to come down on the grass because if I fall I'm, I'm going to take a soft landing I don't want to come down at Jenkins Hill uh, rocky path because if I fall there I might never get up <laughs> <laughs> yeah Skiddaw is particularly lethal it's a very um mountain running you know almost an Italian style hill in terms of the um quite hard packed rocky path and and very fast running you know quite a good runnable gradient so you really would not want to to deck it you know going full tilt down there yeah yeah and and i mean currently you're the world cup mountain running champion aren't you tell us a little bit about that yeah so i got to hang on to the title for an extra year obviously because of covid so so i won it in in 2019 um which was fun it was uh yeah the world cup is just such a great lineup of races because um the world mountain running association um kind of keep it mixed up every year um in terms of what races they choose so off the top of my head i, I can remember um there's races in italy slovenia wales um austria uh, just a real mix and and you know obviously with them being mountain races you always end up somewhere scenic with a lot of kind of culture around the race and the race organizers are always very welcoming and kind of delighted to have a, a an international contingent coming along to kind of showcase their their race too so it's always a big event and always just a kind of quite an exciting opportunity to see somewhere new so it's a series usually or in 2019 it was seven races and I think it was your best six performances um out of that so so you do have to be quite flexible in terms of being able to travel and having 
you know the time to to get out to the different countries um so i was i was quite lucky in that sense to be able to to get out to um six of the races right and and i mean ultimately i mean am i right in assuming that uh, extends from may right through to october i mean that's a long season isn't it yeah it is yeah and then the world championships which is a separate separate competition but that was in argentina in november so I actually ended up taking a break in August, which felt like a really counterintuitive time of year to take a break, um, not least because we were out in our van in the Alps. So, you know, it's quite hard to sort of put your feet up when you're in a setting like that. Um, but I know for myself, I, I like quite a short build up to a race. I don't want to try and drag my season out too much. So I kind of knew from past experience that I really needed that that rest in August or I was just going to be dead on my feet in November, basically. Gotcha. And, and, and th those seven races, what kind of distances do they um, take on? 5K? Um, 20K? Yeah, a bit of a mix. So usually they have one or two that are uphill only and they tend to be really steep. So um, they might be a VK, which if anyone doesn't know is kind of like a, a vertical kilometer so you have to climb a thousand meters uphill only and and they tend to be a kind of 25 to 35 percent gradient um so it might only be like you run three kilometers uh but the you know the winner might do say 30 to 35 minutes winning man um for 3k because you've got to climb a thousand meters so so those races would be the shortest and um, and typically the longest would be right around the 25k mark um, again with quite a lot of climb up and down um, but this year they're including some more like mountain marathon type distances so they'll be obviously longer again gotcha and how long is longer are we talking 30 40k or beyond the marathon distance yeah i think there are i think there are a few marathon distance, but I don't think any of them really go anything over that. Okay, I got gotcha. you. But uh, I mean, I mean, a thousand meters for those of you that are as old as me—that's three thousand feet plus. Um, and and doing three kilometers in thirty-five minutes. I think most of our listeners will be able to do that, but not with a thousand meters climbing in it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, that is a, a heck of a, a heck of a uh, challenge. Brilliant. Anyway, let, let's let's crack on with uh, these questions that I've got planned for you. So, th the first question I've got here, Sarah, is when did you first realise that you could become an international athlete? Um, it was, I think, the the race that sticks out in my mind was actually the Scottish National Cross Country in 2011, where I came fourth, and and I suppose it was just a race, and um, you know, maybe maybe other people can think of that race as well, where you just kind of surprise yourself and and sort of think wow that was a national level race and I wasn't that far off the front I mean I think I remember Freya Murray had a commanding lead so I probably was still a few minutes off her but to come forth um was just kind of an, an unlooked for surprise and uh and and real confidence boosting and made me wonder what else I could do yeah and that's Freya Murray who's now Freya Ross am I right in assuming that yes yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just yeah, to update people, um, Trey Ross, uh, who, who uh, yeah, is is quite a quite a performer over a variety of distances, and certainly one of the top Scottish runners back in the, uh, the I suppose the 20, 2005 to twenty fifteen period. Uh, who, who else were were up there with you? Were there other mountain runners or track runners other than Trey? Yeah, to be honest, I can't remember. It's been a while since I was on the um on kind of the I did I only very much dabbled in the Scottish cross country scene just as a result of the, uh, the club that I was with um but I remember going to the inter-counties running for Scotland East in I think 2012 um, and I think we came second team there um so there was definitely a number of really good um Scottish runners about the place but the names are escaping me I'm, I'm rattling my brains and thinking about Morag McClarty, who's now Morag Miller. And, and, yes, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose Sarah English might have been uh, still around, or she might have been a bit yeah. too young then. I can't remember. Yeah, I yeah. I'm not sure. She she might have been on that. Um, yeah, she's probably a junior, I'm guessing, or under 23 anyway. And then I'm also thinking of the Irish runner uh, who runs for our man. Has she been running? And she's going to kill uh, me remembering the name. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, yeah, I, I did. I got um, 
linked up with the Irish cross country team um, in 2012, actually. Yeah. So then um, have really good memories from, from running with them. And, and, and you were selected, is that the European cross country or the world cross country? Yeah, just the Europeans. Okay. And, and where was that, your first international? Um, that was in, so that cross country was in Hungary. Um, but I had done the European mountain running the year before. So it was the European mountain running that was in Turkey would have been my first international race. Yeah, that's probably when I first met you. 2011 would it have been or? Yeah, yes. I remember, yeah, I remember that one now, yeah. Okay, back in the day, okay. And um, thinking about um, your transition from, I guess, um, um, the ages of 16, 17, through to the ages of 22, 23, were there any particular things that you worked on to enhance your development? Um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a big contrast between when I was 16 and, and kind of when I was um, 19, 20, 21, because when I was at high school, I was on the cross country and track teams and it was pretty laid back in terms of um, we had a lovely coach who made sure that it was kind of um, definitely kept the emphasis on fun, even though, you know, we, we, d we did, you know, have our training sessions and we did drills and it's not that we didn't take it seriously, but I think he understood the importance of the social element and, and making sure that people were enjoying themselves. Um, and, and I never really felt, even though, you know, we had rivalries with different high schools and things, I never felt, um, so much pressure that it wasn't fun. And um, that high school was back in the USA, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and where in the USA were you based? Um, in Michigan. Okay. Uh, a mountain running area? I don't know Michigan that well. It sounds like a lake. No, not lake. It sounds like the ultimate lake district, or not? <laughs> no, it's very flat. Um, my mum's from the lake district, so I, I just always wanted to be here. <laughs> I didn't really want to be in Michigan. Okay. I know the winters are cold. I've got friends who've been to college there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very cold. Yeah, so we did do a lot of... Um, treadmill running when I was at university when it when the snow got too thick to run on the pavement. Okay and which university was that? Michigan State. Okay Michigan State I got you. Um, and, and any other key things I mean you, you said the things changed when you were 18, 19 what did they change to? Yeah so I so when I went to Michigan State and and I was on the cross country and track team there but I was a walk-on so I wasn't recruited or I didn't have a scholarship or anything like that. I just expressed an interest and uh, I think they had a few spare places on the team. Um, so they let me kind of join in <laughs> and, um, and I wasn't, you know, anything special. And, um, and it was obviously it was, you know, there was maybe a bit more pressure. They took it a bit more seriously and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it was the NCAA system. So it's very much of the mentality that, you know, your career is over when you leave uni, unless you're going to go start running road marathons or something. Yeah. So they kind of, yeah, it's very much a case of get as much out of you, you know, in these four years as we possibly can kind of thing. And, and in terms of training, I mean, what would be typical for you for, for training in your first and second year, et cetera, while you were at Michigan State? Um, yeah, we just had kind of two sessions a week and a long run at the weekends and then the rest day, pretty standard, a couple, couple, um, yeah, a couple harder sessions in the week. And I don't think my mileage was anything, you know, out of the ordinary, it was 50 miles a week or something like that. Um, you know, probably kind of what I would consider to be appropriate for for that age in terms of where I was I didn't I didn't struggle with injury but I wasn't kind of um achieving unbelievable results either kind of thing yeah and then I mean I don't think you ever got to go to the division one championships but I know it's often said that they're a much higher standard than even European cross country championships and, and to, to highlight that I think um the winner of the division one 1500 meters and 3000 meters this year uh, was actually younger, but also faster than Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who won the European Indoor Championships, which is an interesting statistic, and, and that kind of sends on the point uh, of the high quality. Um, and, and I'm quoting the men's there, but, but I, th I think the women would replicate that, having recently had people like Jordan Hasse, and, and I dare say some other names that you could quote as well. Yeah, yeah, I never really did any of the um, the big competitions out there. I was very much in the middle of the pack in 
in um, a very strong team. So there was definitely always kind of people ahead of me going to those competitions. Um, but I can say it really gave me a, a good knowledge base of, of how to train once I left uni and I was back kind of just um, on my own devices and, and having to just come up with my own training again. Um, I was confident going to a gym and I was confident coming up with my own sessions and that kind of thing. So I suppose that was a real a real bonus going forward. But I think it's interesting because um, I remember leaving uni and coming to the UK and I moved to Sheffield and did um, the first South Yorkshire Cross Con Country League race of the season. Um, and, and won the women's race and, and I hadn't won a race in like years and years you know after leaving high school so that confidence boost in itself probably you know pushed me on more than anything that had happened at uni where I just felt like oh, I'm not really you know a talent or anything I'm just I'm just here in the middle of the pack kind of thing and um, so it's just amazing kind of what one result can do for how you how you think about what else you're capable of. That's, um, yeah, that, that, that's, that is interesting because I know um, one of the guys I was working with, I think I made his target to try and win the South Yorkshire Cross Country League as a, you know, somebody who hates cross country. Well, you know, let's see if you can win this thing that you hate. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, yeah, we got there in the end. But, but just coming back to, you said you had confidence going in the gym uh, and, and you talked about 50 miles a week while you were at Michigan State. If you had confidence in the gym, where did that come from? Was that part of the programme at Michigan State? Yeah, yeah. So they had, they had a gym. Um, it was for uh, uh, the less popular sports, shall we say. So, so you know, the football team would have their own separate gym and their own massive facility, and the basketball team and the hockey team would have theirs. And then there was kind of a gym for the rest of us who weren't really not kind of income generating sports as such, but um, still a really nice facility. And uh, and you'd just go in there, and there'd be kind of the trainers who would have already discussed with your coaches what they wanted you to be doing, and and um, so if you had any questions or anything you could ask but otherwise you had it written down on a piece of paper what your what your session was and you were just meant to do that a couple times a week basically um so yeah it was just having having that kind of few years where you just felt like going to the gym was normal and you knew what you were doing and you had people to correct your technique that kind of thing um I think I'm not naturally someone who would necessarily be confident walking into a gym if I hadn't had that kind of background Gotcha. So, so just to summarise, um, you, you had um, a strength and conditioning coach at Michigan State and they would oversee your gym work um, twice a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, and in terms of that gym work, um, did it involve heavy weights? Did you gain much muscle? Um, or was it non-weight, you know, non-weight lifting based? How, how did it work? Just, just get an idea of what somebody you know, who, who's gone on to achieve what you've achieved, what you were doing at 17, 18, 19, 20? Yeah, it was, uh, trying to think now, I mean, pretty kind of traditional stuff. So I remember like step-ups, lunges, um, a, a certain amount of upper body work as well. Um, yeah, it's hard to think back now, but it was very kind of general, you know, it wasn't, uh, they didn't sort of just have you doing squats, squats, squats as a runner or whatever. It was kind of um, quite general strength based stuff to just, um, I think, just kind of give you an all round strength base rather than um, anything too specific. OK, and that include balance and stability work as well. Yeah, and we did kind of a lot of drills and skipping and that sort of thing every day um, before going out training. So th there was that kind of element in our day to day warm up as well. I, well, I mean, the, re the reason that I, I focus on that is because uh, really, it's, you know, in my opinion, it's the bedrock of um, uh, building the, the, the robustness of an athlete moving on. And um, and, and talking about moving on, I mean, in terms of injuries, have you had many injuries over the years? Um, I used to get a lot more. Uh, I would say, you know, going back to strength training, some, some exercises that really helped me is... Um, deadlifts and yeah particularly deadlifts I suppose I used to get a lot more hamstring issues and in terms of just minor pulls and things when I was in my mid-20s I think I had a, quite a big overstride that was putting a lot of strain kind of on the rear chain muscles and um, and just doing 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 a bit of strengthening of the kind of glutes and hamstrings and that whole 
kind of line of muscles, but also um, like work with the skipping rope and that kind of thing to just get a little bit more um, off my heels all the time kind of thing when I'm, um, you know, out running. I obviously still heel strike um, when it's more appropriate to do so, like on a big long descent, but I'm not heel striking my way around a, a speed session. And, and that definitely seems to have taken a bit of the strain off my hamstrings. Gotcha. And, and, and I mean, you're quite a tall runner, if I remember right. It's a while since I've seen you. Mm -hmm. How tall is tall? Can I? 5'8", uh, whatever that is in centimetres, I'm not sure. But yeah, moderately tall. Yeah, moderately tall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for some reason, it had in the back of my mind you were taller than that. But, uh, but, but invariably, I, I think, again, taller athletes, and, you know, I tend to think that strength and conditioning is even more important with those. Uh, and as you've said, you are, you know, tend to be a bit of an overstrider. So, so uh, issues to think about there. And again, for the people watching this, I dare say they may um, relate to some of the issues that you've discussed there. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, so think about your training now. I mean, which parts of training do you not like? And how do you overcome what you don't enjoy doing these days? Or at, at certain times in your transitions? Yeah, good question. Um, I suppose there are there are elements of training that are just a bit more, a bit less stimulating, shall we say. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, since I swapped to mountain running, I never kind of struggled to get out for a run. Um, compared to road running, I just love being out in the hills. So unless it's really pouring rain, in which case I maybe take an audio book in my headphones or something, but I don't really find it hard to get out the door in terms of um, going for a run. Uh, I would say there are things like, you know, um, some breathing exercises and mobility work that's just like maybe a little bit harder to get yourself to do, especially I'm someone who likes to just go to the gym and do a block of, of stuff in the gym and then go home. So with the gym being closed for three or four months, um, I find that a bit harder. So again, I kind of like the the idea of putting on a, an audio book or something so that I um, don't necessarily feel like I'm just lying there kind of waiting for the breathing exercises to be over or whatever, just ways of making things a little bit more enjoyable. And, you know, if you find something boring, kind of giving yourself a way to make it a bit more fun. Gotcha. Yeah, I've got you. Um, good, good, good. And then... Any, any particular issues, and I'm thinking particularly when you first started the strength and conditioning, was that easy to adjust to? Um... Yeah, um, it's a, an interesting one. I feel like, say, for instance, when I started, it was actually Robbie Williams, who's the strength trainer in Cork, who got me doing a lot more deadlifting. Um, he has a gym in Cork called Fitness Works. And um, so at that time, I was doing my... Um, writing up my PhD so I was very working very flexibly from home so it was actually a really great um, part of my day to be able to get out get out to the gym each day um, he, you know like I, I was kind of rehabbing from an injury so he was saying pretty much just come to the gym every day and do something so um, I think that in that time I, w I was only running every other day and so coming to the gym was both like a bit of a social experience and um, it wasn't a massive load on top of my low mileage. So yeah, I think because my mileage was low and it was a fun part of my day, it wasn't really, it wasn't that difficult to kind of work it in. Um, but when we get traveling in the van, it's a lot harder. We bring a few kettlebells and they usually roll around in the back. <laughs> but um, that's kind of the best we can do is just some, some kettlebells to, to try and maintain things and then, and then build back up a bit more in the winter with the strength training. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then moving on to your um, uh, positive aspects of uh, uh, your coach, coaches, um, you know, through the ages, um, have you had many coaches and, you know, what have been the best things about the coaches that you've worked with? Yeah, um, I've had quite a few now. So I had the, the high school coach and then two coaches in uh, college. Um, and then after that, I had... Um, a hill running coach in Scotland called Gregor Nicholson, who kind of really encouraged me to um, to go for the Irish team. And, and uh, so he, he was a big um, influence on me in terms of he'd coached other um, international runners. He's a, he coaches primarily juniors. So he kind of knew a lot about, um, you know, getting people uh, in contact with the team managers and, you know, 
helping helping you to register an interest in trying to make the team and helping you to target a trial and that sort of thing so he was he was really helpful in getting me linked up with the Irish team managers and, and helping me train specifically for my first trial race um, and after that uh, Gregor actually got me linked up with um, Chris Jones who at the time was the Irish head coach for um, the cross country team um, and so then they kind of both together worked on my plan because Gregor would bring the mountain running side of things and Chris would um, add a kind of more of a cross country and, and an overall stru structure <laughs> to the plan um, and uh, yeah then after Chris I kind of um, kind of went just solo for a bit um, and that was up until a about a year ago um, and, now, and now I'm working with Robbie Simpson. Um, who's doing the mountain running plan for me. I think, as I said, I've, I've done some work with uh, Robbie a long time ago when he was a, a wee bairn. But, uh, yes. He's certainly, uh, he's, he's rolling along in the marathon these days and I think uh, he always had a look for the long distances. Um, yes. But, but, but just coming back to those coaches, um, I, and I know you, you mentioned that uh, Gregor Nich Nicholson, he was particularly good about aligning you to trials races and, and selections or how to go about getting selected. Um, what about the positive aspects of, um, you know, what, what Chris Jones offered? Was it scientific or was it uh, something else? Did you do longer runs with him or particular interval sessions? Um, and likewise um, with, um, with Robbie, what, what, what specific things did they give to you that perhaps you didn't have previously? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I wouldn't say that any of my coaches were unscientific, but um, Chris certainly has a really strong background and, you know, and gives a lot of talks and things like that in educating coaches. So he certainly knows his stuff and um, has done a lot of reading. And, and I suppose his his forte was really in the, the speed training and, and the endurance training, um, whereas Gregor's was more in the mountain side of things. Um, and I think some of my best runs um, at that time came from their actual combined plan um, because you really do, I think you really do need an, an understanding of the, the demands of mountain racing um, to have a good, you know, plan for, for mountain races. And, and Gregor brought that, whereas Chris got me into my 5K PB shape and, um, you know... Amanda, you've got that 5K, 10K PBs that they are? Um, 15, 46 and... 33 33 still gonna try and improve that 10k one sometime okay well i think with the the, the shoe technology out there people yeah. would argue that you know it's a, a walk in the park <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i don't think anybody's walking that fast these days so <laughs> you might have to run it yeah 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 absolutely and then uh, robbie what did what robbie brought to your program um yeah, Robbie um, is a really accomplished mountain runner and marathoner in his own right. So, um, so he he really has a good understanding of how to mimic the demands of a mountain race and and the fact that mountain races are so varied. You know, it's not like training for a five k or ten k where you know almost beforehand what pace you're targeting and and you you can come at it very specifically. You know, with mountain racing, you could be doing a a 45 minute race one weekend and a three hour race the next weekend and it's much more about getting very generally fit for the demands of the mountains and and just trying to train all the different elements of mountain running um without narrowing yourself down too much okay um and, and in terms of uh, your preparation in terms of diet um have you got any unique things that you address um, you know, for particularly for longer events, uh, but also perhaps shorter events in terms of uh, meeting the dietary needs of, uh, you know, these 45k or 35 minute vertical kilometers. Any... Um, yeah, I mean, I do focus a lot on just protein intake um, in my day to day. So um, I usually have skier for breakfast. I'm vegetarian. So um, just trying to get kind of get some protein in at every meal. Um, is one of my main things is in terms of kind of recovery. Um, and then, yeah, I think definitely food intake during the longer races is super important. And, and in fell running, at least here in the UK, I think it's often overlooked. Whereas, you know, road marathoners are well aware of you really need to be eating something every 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but you get people 
doing fell races that are three to four hours who haven't necessarily thought too much about how much food they need to get around. Um, just culturally, I think, you know, again, potentially because there's such a big um, variety of distances in fell running and mountain running that, uh, you know, you're not, you're not training specifically for one race. You just show up at the start line. The race happens to be three or four hours and people haven't necessarily considered how they're going to get around. So, um, yeah, I just tend to take jelly babies or gels or um, mountain fuel a bit, try and just take a bit of everything, a bit of mountain fuel in my drink and uh, and a bit of solid food and, and aiming for kind of 150 calories per hour type of thing. I try and stay on the, the lower end of the, um, what I can get away with just so that I avoid any sort of tummy issues as well. Okay, good, good. Um, and, and yeah, a, a good insight there into uh, uh, preparation for the races. And, and in, in terms of um, the, the, the go-to fuel um, with 150 calories per hour you were talking about, um, um, I forget the name of it, I didn't write it down, the name of your fuel source. Uh, mountain fuel yeah there's um it's a company that's based here in the lake district but i think they're kind of international now and um yeah definitely pretty widely accepted in in the mountain running world in terms of like very easy to digest um kind of gels and drinks and that sort of thing and what would you say one of those camelback things or is this something you'd pick up on route it depends a little bit on the race there's certain races where you can kind of have friends along the way who'll hand you things and then other races where the the course doesn't really allow for that so it does depend very much like obviously you don't really want to be tied into carrying a lot of water if you don't have to um but it really just depends on the day uh usually you can get water en route if it's quite a long race so in that case i'll just pack as many gels and, and jellies as i'm going to need gotcha okay and and uh, obviously getting the right diet is right. In in terms of the challenges of mountain running, which ones do you find the most challenging? Is it the distance, the longer the distance, or is it the technical terrain going up, coming down? Um, I can't imagine it's the flat areas because she's such an accomplished flat runner. But uh, I don't know what, what do you find most challenging in mountain running. Yeah, I think so I haven't man mentioned navigation. <laughs> that was my oh, that was yeah. one I struggled with navigation. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't be a great navigator, definitely not. But um, I suppose with the mountain races in, on the continent, they're mostly marked, so that's fine. Um, in the UK, it would be a case of, of running the route beforehand and, and um, running it by memory more than navigating. Also because navigating, you know, you have to take time and have your map and compass out and it slows you down a bit, so you're better off if you can just know the route beforehand, that's always going to be better. Um, but you have to rely on it being a clear day for that. Right. <laughs> yeah. and you but, um, I was gonna say, do you have a preference for uphill or downhill? Uh, depends on the gradient. I do love a fast runnable downhill. Um, I wouldn't be as strong at the steep downhills, but I feel I've made progress with them and yeah it's always gradual stuff is better for me because because of the faster kind of road and and cross-country background gotcha so this terrain in the back, at the back of me you'd love yes yeah that'd be very nice yeah <laughs> and and just one final question um are there any other events that you'd uh, wish you'd tried um are you planning to try before you retire you know and uh with athletes, I, I might say it's a shot put or orientate, but it won't be orienteering by the sounds of it. But, uh, uh, no. <laughs> any other events that you wish you'd tried? Um, not, I don't know. I think a uh, steeplechase would have been interesting, but I can't say, you know, that I'd, yeah, I probably wouldn't go back to track across country too much, apart from I'd quite like to, as I say, maybe target a 10K or half marathon as it fits in with my mountain training. But uh, I'd like to get into some longer races as well. So maybe like what you'd call ultra distance races, not too yeah. long, but, you know, 50K, possibly 50 miles. It's interesting you should say that because I think I was chatting once with uh, Vanula McCormack and she said she'd love to do a 5,000 metre steeplechase. Um, oh yeah can i can i put you in that same uh, bracket and i'll let Fanula know about it 
<laughs> I was trying to convince Vanilla to come do some mountain running. So if you see her, you need to tell her we're still we're still waiting because she'd be a fantastic addition to the team. I'm, well, I, I dare say she'll probably watch this, and uh, I'm sure she'll hear you. But uh, if not, I will try to negotiate a contract. Uh, one fell race for one five thousand meter steeple chase. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds That'd be good. Brilliant! Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for doing this, Sarah. There's lots of gold dust that we've uh, picked up from this. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that people watching it will really enjoy this. Um, I wish you the best of luck for the rest of uh, this summer season when it gets underway. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. And hope to see you defending that 2021 uh, World Mountain Running Cup and uh, see you up on those podiums again. Brilliant. Thanks, Basha. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sarah. Bye. Bye. Just press pause.